I'm, I'm going to be talking about some of the storms today. There's no way to cover all 15, uh, but I want to bounce around and share some of the work that I did to pull together this history. It's fascinating. It's terrifying. Uh, in some cases, it's um, it, it when you look at one storm compared to the other, you, you quickly realize that no two hurricanes are the same. Each has its own unique, uh, leaves its own unique mark on our history. Now, just since my first book came out in 1995, these are the storms that have affected North Carolina um, during that period of time. So it's been keeping me busy. You know, when you write a book about history that's constantly unfolding, you're never finished. So that's one of the things that is going to be a challenge um, over the years is we're going to continue to get hit by storms, new storms that will be newsmakers and that will set new records. I'd like to begin <clears throat> by saying that Christopher Columbus discovered hurricanes. And the reason I say that is because he was the first European to experience a tropical cyclone. Uh, amazingly, it wasn't until his fourth voyage into the New World that he came across this storm. And it was a devastating storm for his uh, fleet of ships. Uh, he lost something like five vessels, uh, dozens of men, many, many horses, all lost to, to the ocean during this storm. And it was such a great tragedy he finally recouped his fleet and wrote an eloquent letter to Queen Isabella describing uh, sailing through the pits of hell. And, and to, to Columbus, what was interesting to me is that he likened this bad, bad storm to a particular longitude and latitude. And he swore he would never sail to that place again. Not understanding, of course, that hurricanes, tropical cyclones move about uh, from one place to the other. Um, but it wasn't uh, Columbus, of course, that was the first to discover them because uh, for eons, uh, we've had tropical weather here uh, in this part of the world. In fact, the very word hurricane is derived from the Mayan storm god, Huracan. Through the colonial period, while uh, the English and the Spaniards and the Portuguese and the Dutch and the um, the French and all the, the, the nations of Europe were battling it out, trying to establish a foothold in the New World. It was hurricanes very often that thwarted them. Uh, they were at war with each other, sure, but many of the storms that swept through uh, wrecked fleets, and that's one of the reasons that you can go down in the Keys, for example, and there are dozens and dozens of Spanish galleons sunk along the Florida Straits, um, taking with them the gold and silver that the uh, Spaniards had plundered from Central and South America. Um, and then here on the North Carolina coast, of course, we have a rich history at sea as well. And if you uh, look at David Stick's wonderful book, Graveyard of the Atlantic, um, it sort of tells this story by itself. You, you can look at a map and see there are thousands of wrecks along our coast. Not all of them are the, the result of tropical storms and hurricanes, but many of them are. Now, as I go through, and as I'm researching and, and trying to learn as much as I can about storms of the past, you know, I'm always fascinated whenever we find a story uh, that turns out to be a true story, perhaps at one point, and then it becomes a legend and ultimately lore. And uh, I'll start with this one in 1822. In 1822, there was a devastating hurricane that struck uh, the upper reaches of the South Carolina coast in the Georgetown area, um, absolutely devastating, killed over 200 people. Uh, many of them were slaves that drowned in their quarters. Um, but it was, the, it was just a few weeks before that something really interesting happened. This, uh, this young Lieutenant uh, in the military was stationed in a garrison in Charleston, and he was engaged to a young lady who lived um, up, the, up the coast a little bit. Uh, and he was gonna have to uh, travel by horseback to see her on his leave. And he made the, the journey through the night, uh, trying to reach uh, his bride-to-be. And um, unfortunately, his horse became stuck in quicksand. Uh, the tide came in, he was caught, and he and his horse drowned, a very tragic event as he was heading up to meet his bride-to-be. And so, um, it, as the story goes, uh, a few weeks later, his ghostly image appeared on the beach in front of his fiance to warn her of an impending storm, a horrible storm that was about to strike uh, this area, Pauly's Island. And uh, so she went and told her parents of this vision that she had seen, and they believed her. They fled 
Pawleys Island. And sure enough, a week later, a horrible hurricane struck Pawleys Island and their home was spared. So this was the origin of the legend of the gray man, which is perhaps South Carolina's most famous ghost story, all began with this tale from 1822. The gray man is uh, certainly um, popped up from time to time and most recently uh, sightings during Hurricane Florence, if you believe the news reports. Another story that uh, I like to tell that's, again, a true story that um, is quite compelling. Uh, it'll take just a moment to, to break it down, but uh, many of you probably have been to Swan Quarter, North Carolina. Swan Quarter is a small fishing and agricultural community in Hyde County. And back in the late 1800s, um, Hyde County and Swan Quarter, frankly, were a lot like they are today. Um, probably not more than five or 600 residents in the town. Uh, they make their living fishing and crabbing. Um, this particular um, group of, uh, there was a group of Methodists that were living in Swan Quarter in 1876 who had been worshiping in a barn. And they were um, very dissatisfied. They, they really a, a, a justifiable place to worship. So they decided to build a church and they approached a, a landowner who owned the perfect spot right in the heart of Swan Quarter, right on the corner of Main Street, if you will, um, was a, a piece of vacant land owned by a gentleman by the name of Mr. Sadler. The Methodists approached Mr. Sadler and made him a generous offer and Sadler refused to sell. He didn't want to have anything to do with the Methodists. So they were a little disappointed. And and a couple of weeks later and made a higher offer. This would be the perfect spot for their new church, but again, Sadler refused to sell. So that summer, they, they were a little discouraged, but they found an alternate piece of property. It was down the street a little ways, a little closer to the marsh, um, but they found a good spot for their, their new church, and, and on a beautiful Sunday morning in early September, they dedicated the Providence Church. Not anything really special, but it was special to them, and um, it was also um, going to be a very short-lived location because what happened next was quite miraculous. The storm came sweeping towards Swan Quarter, and of course, this is 1876, so they didn't have the Weather Channel. They didn't have the internet or radio or really any means of communication to understand that this storm was coming. So the way in 1876 you kind of knew things were getting bad was the wind started to blow and it started to rain. The fishermen pulled in their nets. Everyone got their boats out of the water. They hunkered down because they knew this was going to be a big storm. And it came through during the daytime. And amazingly, they watched out their windows as the tides filled the streets of Swan Quarter. This little church that they had just dedicated floated up off of its foundation, and it began to slowly drift down the street. And you can see where this is going. It was headed right for Mr. Sadler's property. It launched itself down the street, spun around 90 degrees, and came to rest exactly in the spot where it would have been built if Sadler had agreed to sell. So everyone poured out of their homes after the storm was gone, the tides receded, and stood around in amazement at this church that had navigated some eight blocks, turned itself, and positioned it perfectly on the corner in downtown Swan Quarter. And if you go there today, uh, please look for the historical marker for the Providence Methodist Church moved by the hand of God on September 16th, 1876. Now, we're very lucky to know that today uh, we have a lot of advantages over the, the families in 1876 because we can see the storms coming. The folks at the National Hurricane Center and the National Weather Service do a great job. We've got satellites. Uh, we've got modern technology and communication to let people know uh, what's about to happen. Uh, that has not always been the case. So as we go back through and look at the 15 storms, I'm not going to be able to touch on all of them, but a couple of points I want to make, and then I'm going to talk about some of the lessons. Um, the 1752 Charleston hurricane is the first one that I've mentioned. And by reading the all the accounts, uh, both from ships at sea, as well as the people of Charleston, this is probably the strongest hurricane ever to hit South Carolina. We don't know for sure. We don't have barometric pressures and wind speed records, but just based on the anecdotal evidence, it was a devastating storm. And what was interesting too about this 1752 storm is that just two weeks later, it was followed by another powerful storm that struck the North Carolina coast. 
And this storm uh, swept through the town of Johnston in Onslow County and destroyed the courthouse. Uh, the, the county seat actually had to be moved to Jacksonville as a result of this storm in 1752. A lot of, a lot of great um, tales from this particular hurricane included in my book. Uh, in 1893, um, this was the deadliest of the 15. And this was the Sea Islands hurricane, which made landfall near Hilton Head um, in, in uh, August of 1893, again, at a time when there was no warning. And the people that were affected were the Gula people. These were the descendants of slaves um, that were uh, living in the area, the Sea Island area there around uh, Hilton Head and, and that's, that sort of southern end of South Carolina had the largest population of Black farmers in the country. It was a very uh, prosperous area in the 1890s, but it was devastated when this wall of water swept over the region and uh, close to 2,500 lives were lost as a result. Uh, and this was so devastating that uh, I'll tell you some stories a little bit later about the recovery, but it was um, it was probably one of the, the, or at the time, it was the greatest disaster in the young nation's history, um, but it was soon followed by even greater disasters because even though there were close to 3,000 killed there in South Carolina, just a few years later in Galveston, there were like 12,000 people lost their lives with the great Galveston storm. So it was a time of great, great tragedies uh, in, due to hurricanes in the United States. One of the stories that came out of the 1893 storm was actually not in North Carolina, South Carolina, but up here in North Carolina. And it's, it's the story of Captain Dunbar Davis. I wish I had time to go into the details of this with you today, but um, it's fascinating. This was the life-saving station captain at Oak Island. And it turns out that his crew was on leave. He was by himself when the storm roared through and he works tirelessly for some 72 hours uh, without sleep saving over two dozen crew members who um, went overboard and were swept ashore, and he brought all of them in alive. The 1899 hurricane season was deadly as well. Um, it started actually in Puerto Rico, where the, the San Sirico hurricane of that year um, struck Puerto Rico and killed about 2,500 people, and then came to the Outer Banks of North Carolina. The devastation all up and down the North Carolina coast was um, was unprecedented really for that period of time for, for this region, the number of vessels that went down, including the Priscilla uh, up near Ocracoke. So um, read about the 1899 San Sirico storm and you'll hear all kinds of tales from Cape Hatteras through Carteret County and inland as well. But then the second half of that season uh, was another big storm and it came ashore again in Wilmington. So what, once again, two big hurricanes hitting our state uh, within a short period of time. And that second one struck on Halloween day uh, near Wilmington. And this is the um, Carolina Beach Yacht Club, which was swept off of its foundation. Uh, this storm completely washed out the railroad tracks that ran down Wrightsville Beach uh, during that period of time. 1916. Uh, if you look closely, you'll notice that's the Blue Ridge Mountains in the background of this photograph. And you might be thinking, what is a picture of that region doing in a talk about hurricanes? But, but believe it or not, the mountains of North Carolina and South Carolina have been battered by storms many times. The 1916 flood is considered um, prior to Floyd as the greatest flood in North Carolina's history. And it was the result of two storms, one striking the South Carolina coast the other striking the Mississippi coast, both of which dissolve, uh, sort of began to their, their uh, dissolution over the Blue Ridge Mountains, dumping tremendous rains and setting a new US rainfall record in the process of 22.22 inches of rain in 24 hours. That was up near Asheville. And uh, the flooding was so bad, uh, it washed away every uh, railroad trestle and road bridge on most of the major rivers in the, in the western half of the state, essentially cutting off, uh, cutting North Carolina in half. There was no transportation of, uh, possible uh, because all the bridges were swept away. Uh, really a, a, a fascinating story about how the Southern Railway came 
back to rebuild um, most of the farmland in that region, a lot of the topsoil was sw swept away. And so the farmers struggled and many of the farmers had to turn and go to work for the railway uh, as a result because it was the only way they could survive. But it helped to reestablish the communication and transportation systems in the western part of the state, which was critically important at the time. 1933, height of the Great Depression. Once again, two hurricanes hit North Carolina in the same year, both of them pretty significant. The first being a September storm uh, that came ashore um, in Carteret County, uh, probably category three, and was considered um, by many to be the, the greatest flood in New Bern, uh, down east area of Carteret County. Uh, a lot of the old timers will talk about the 33 storm as the highest water they had seen. The second storm uh, hit the Outer Banks and went on up into Virginia and became the greatest flood in Norfolk's history. So we, we share um, history sometimes between our states because these storms, they don't stay in one place. They move about. And in the case of the really bad ones, they affect multiple states. Now, during the 1950s, it got really busy. Um, North Carolina and South Carolina were battered by eight hurricanes in seven years. And uh, we don't have time to talk about all of them, but of course, Hazel was the, uh, the biggest and baddest of that group. Hurricane Hazel was in 1954, and it was a little unusual because it was an October storm. We tend to think of our hurricanes as August or September, but not all are that time of year. And this uh, particular storm came through the middle of October and made landfall right at the North Carolina, South Carolina border, um, right at um, around Little River Inlet on October 15th. And you'll see the track of the storm as it plowed into the, the Myrtle Beach area, the Brunswick County beaches, and then set a course straight up uh, through the middle of North Carolina. And that of course took it right here through the Triangle area where Hazel was um, again, a, a, an epic storm, one for the memory books because we, we don't see um, powerful storms like Hazel in the Carolinas very often. Hurricane Hazel at landfall was a Cat 4. And um, if you go back to the National Weather Service records, and they only go back, by the way, to 1851, but going back all that way, uh, Hazel's the only Category 4 to hit North Carolina. We've never had a Cat 5 that we have any record of. And in fact, it's the northernmost landfall for a Category 4. Uh, there have been Category 4s in South Carolina and, and farther south, but uh, Hazel still stands out in that regard. What, one of the things that made Hazel such a devastating storm was it struck on a full moon high tide, the highest lunar tide of the year in October. Um, and so the storm surge, the rise in sea level down at the coast, was the most dramatic uh, of all the images we have from the storm. Uh, this is a Carolina beach where the storm surge was about 15 feet, but at Calabash, it was about 18 feet, an 18 foot rise in sea level. That's not even counting the waves that ride up on top of the ocean level. So this was an elevation of storm surge, unlike anything we had seen in the, in the Carolinas to that time. And of course, um, the, the, Devastation along the beachfront was universal from, you know, Garden City and southern parts of Myrtle Beach all the way north to Carteret County. Um, but the good news was that because it was October and this was 1954, there weren't very many people out on the beach. The beaches and the cottages actually were mostly empty. They'd been boarded up for the winter because back in the 50s, not many people lived on the islands and they certainly didn't vacation there unless maybe they were going fishing in October. So um, we know that uh, the devastation could have been, or the death toll could have been much, much higher uh, had uh, the storm uh, struck a, a time when there were tourists uh, filling those beach houses. And now one of the great stories uh, from Hazel, and there are so many, but it's been told many times, and that's uh, Connie and Jerry Helms' uh, ordeal. Connie and Jerry were honeymooning on Long Beach, which is Oak Island, during Hazel, and they were in a little tiny cottage. Um, they were, I think, 19, 20 years old. They didn't, they weren't paying any attention to the news. They didn't know a storm was coming. And they went to bed that night with no knowledge that uh, this cat four was about to strike right where they were. And um, they woke up about 5.30 in the morning to this horrible crashing sound. Uh, they knew it was storming and raining, but they didn't know how bad it was until they re realized it 
waves were breaking on the front porch of their little bungalow. And they, the tide was coming in so quickly, they jumped up out of bed, ran outside and realized the Jeep was already starting to flood. They had no way to escape. So they grabbed uh, um, what they could and, and it, by now the water was chest deep. They, the little cottage they were in was getting ready to get demolished. Uh, they were afraid they were gonna be swept out to sea. Uh, they walked uh, just a couple of blocks down uh, through chest deep water and broke in a window and went up to a second story in a bigger cottage where they thought they might be able to ride it out. But this house was no match for Hazel either. It was about to buckle and fall apart. But from the second story window, they floated Connie on a mattress out the window, and Jerry just grabbed on and held on to that mattress. And uh, it took about uh, probably four or five hours before they finally came to stop in the treetops uh, on the backside of the island. Jerry grabbed a tree branch and held on as the tides eventually went back down. But they had survived, and it was a miraculous thing. Uh, they were cold, they were battered, beaten up, but they climbed down through the muck and walked all through the night. Finally got that back out to the main highway sometime around dawn the next day uh, where they were picked up. And then two days later, um, they were just curious. They had to see what was left of Long Beach. Was there anything left uh, of the cottage or the Jeep or what, what did it look like? And they went back out and they couldn't, they were bewildered. They couldn't find the cottage where it had been. There were no street signs. There weren't even any fire hydrants visible anymore because sand had either covered them up or they had been washed out uh, by the, the churning waves. So eventually they did find miraculously the refrigerator that had been inside their little cottage. It was buried in the sand somewhere down on the beach and uh, they started digging in it and inside they found the top of their wedding cake and sat on the beach and had a little celebration to uh, sir, uh, celebrate the survival uh, of that storm. But I will tell you that when you talk with Connie and Jerry today uh, about it, it is uh, still something that's very fresh in their memory. They uh, they certainly have a tale to tell and, and they have told it to uh, the Weather Channel and others, uh, fascinating story. And there are many others like that uh, from Hurricane Hazel. Hazel, as it roared through Raleigh, of course, um, left devastation. The city of Oaks was the city of fallen Oaks. That's one of the headlines. And uh, But it wasn't over because when Hazel passed through North Carolina, it raced into Virginia with a forward speed of almost 50 miles per hour. And what that means is that when you've got a rotating wind that's racing forward, everything on the eastern side of the storm is accelerated. And so the highest winds ever recorded um, in many cities uh, along the eastern seaboard were recorded during Hazel. Places like Dover and Philadelphia and uh, Baltimore and New York City, actually, the highest wind recorded ever in the city was 113 mile per hour gust during Hurricane Hazel uh, down at the Battery. Um, so what we know as, as the storm was racing northward, it then merged with a low pressure system coming off the Great Lakes, went on into Canada and became the greatest flood in Canadian history, actually killed more people in Canada than it had killed in the United States. So from deep in the Caribbean to above the Arctic Circle, Hurricane Hazel was um, a tragic event. Um, back in the early 2000s, uh, I had the opportunity to work with a group on a uh, historical marker for Hazel and uh, was there when we unveiled it. And there's Jerry, uh, Jerry Jones there to help me with uh, uh, uncovering that plaque. The last of the storms of the 50s was in 1960 was Hurricane Donna, a powerful storm in the Keys, a category four. Uh, it crossed over Florida as a category three, went back into the Atlantic, hit North Carolina as a category two, then went back into the Atlantic and hit New England as a category two. The only storm in our record that has hit Florida, the Carolinas and New England as a hurricane. And then something really weird happened. It got real quiet. After all those storms through the fifties, all the, all the activity, one after another, sometimes multiple storms in one year, uh, during the sixties and seventies, we had very few hurricanes in the Carolinas. Very few to speak of, not much to write about. Um, and it wasn't until the 80s when things started getting busy again. And it was um, Hurricane Hugo, though, that really got everyone's attention. 
it was a wake up call of wake up calls because it was another category four hurricane that um, approached the Carolinas. And this time it made landfall a little bit north of Charleston as a cat four. The devastation on the oceanfront beaches there with a 19 foot storm surge um, was again, very complete places like Isle of Palms all the way up into Myrtle Beach actually. Um, and the storm, again, was another one of these that was so powerful, so big as it moved inland, it cut a path across the Carolinas uh, and into Charlotte, where Charlotte was brought to its knees by this storm. Uh, talk to anybody who was in uh, Charlotte in 1989, and they will have Hugo stories to tell. One of the stories that um, uh, is, is, I guess, is a miracle, somewhat of a miracle, uh, happened in a little town of McClellanville during Hurricane Hugo. McClellanville is a small fishing village right near the center of the, the I guess you could call ground zero of where Hugo came ashore. It turns out that the small town of McClellanville used their high school as a, an evacuation shelter, uh, and it was packed. The afternoon of the storm, families came, small children, everybody poured into the school, uh, and to wait it out with what supplies they had. Um, but what they didn't realize was that an error had been made on some of the maps that laid out the topography of the area. And this, sh this never should have been a shelter because it was not at its sufficient elevation. But as Hurricane Hugo rolled through and that 16 foot wall of water rolled through the streets of McClellanville, the school became swamped. And here we have three to 400 residents in a school with no electricity, it's dark. The water is now seeping under the doors. The doors are locked. Everyone can't get out and the water starts rising and it keeps rising and it gets to waist high and everyone panics. They move into the cafeteria and stand on top of the lunchroom tables and the water continues rising until it gets neck deep on many people. Some of them just start swimming, free swimming uh, to try to deal with this uh, situation. Can you imagine the, the, the trauma, the tragic, uh, I guess the emotional um, roller coaster you would go through being in such a horrible situation? Fortunately though, the water got all the way to the, I guess, near the, the ceiling in some of the rooms, and then it peaked and began to go back down. By this time, some people had already climbed out onto the roof to try to escape, and that wasn't a good idea in 100 plus mile an hour winds. So the good news is the tides receded and everyone survived their night in the, um, in the high school. Uh, and as they poured out of the school the next day, uh, they, they found their cars, but they weren't exactly where they left them. So this is another one of those stories about Hurricane Hugo that uh, there are many that um, are quite chilling. We could talk all day about Hurricane Fran. Um, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it because it's a more recent storm. Some of you probably experienced Fran here in Raleigh. Uh, it was a category three that made landfall in New Hanover County, and then much like Hazel, marched right through Raleigh and did a, a tremendous amount of damage in the Triangle, uh, tree damage in particular. But it was, a, again, a somewhat of a wake-up call for uh, those of us who uh, maybe, it was my first big hurricane to experience. And I think one of the things that we all recognize is that uh, when we, we think about the hurricanes we've experienced in our lives, we do take them personally. And so those that we have been through and experienced, we remember vividly. Hurricane Floyd, just three years later, um, was a devastating storm, unlike any that we had seen, a flood like in anything we had seen in a long time in eastern North Carolina. And the, the scenes that we saw uh, were hard to believe because, for one thing, people became accustomed to thinking of hurricanes as windstorms, when in actuality, it wasn't the winds from Floyd that were the problem, it was the rain. And so we saw things across Eastern North Carolina during Hurricane Floyd that we never thought we would see. Communities uh, completely submerged where no one had ever seen it flood before. Um, so a lot of tragic uh, stories and tales to tell from Hurricane Floyd. And it continued on um, over the, the next uh, couple of decades with other storms that had similar kinds of impacts. And again, won't spend a lot of time on Matthew in 2016 or in Florence, because these are fresh memories for many of us. Florence, of course, was at one time a Cat 4 approaching the North Carolina coast. And 
thankfully, it weakened significantly and slowed down as it made landfall. And when it slowed down, I mean it slowed down. As it struck Wrightsville Beach, by the time it, it did hit, it was a Category 1, dropped from a 4 to a 1 in about two days. Um, that was good news, but the bad news was it was such a slow mover. Its move from Wrightsville Beach to Conway was about the speed that you or I could walk. So um, something like two, two and a half mile per hour advance, that's, uh, that's giving all the, the rain clouds plenty of time to dump out their rain. And you'll see uh, a new North Carolina rainfall record was established during Florence in Elizabethtown of almost 36 inches. So we've got this, this history of, of these great storms. And when you, when you look at the dollar damages in, involved, um, you can see that um, storms like Bertha and Fran, Dennis and Floyd, um, those were record setters. Uh, Floyd at six billion, no one had ever seen $6 billion in North Carolina back in 1999. But um, now take a look at Hurricane Florence at 24 billion, and that is only the figure for North Carolina. That does not include South Carolina as well. Now, in my book, I've, I tried to, one of the things that was important to me was to not only tell the stories, and capture the information about each storm. But I wanted to present um, also to, to the reader uh, some means of understanding what do we get from this history? What do we learn? What are the takeaways? And there are lots, and I tried to capture many of them. Today, I'm only gonna hit on just a few, but some of them are, I guess you'd say some of them are fundamental uh, and, and pretty simple, and others are really lessons learned. Um, the first one that truly is a fundamental one is that if you are going to live or build near the water, then you've got a lot of special things to consider. Uh, a lot of uh, things about how and where you build your home. Um, and for those people who, um, as, and I'm not talking about just uh, down by the ocean or down by a bay or sea, what I'm referring to is even in Eastern North Carolina, near the rivers that crisscross our state. Um, one of the things that realtors often talk about is location, location, location. And I would add to that, that um, you might wanna also consider elevation, elevation, elevation. Um, that's one of the lessons learned. And, and a lot of places you've seen a progression where homes are rebuilt and they're stepped up or they're built higher and higher over the years uh, because of past floods. Another is architectural adaptation, and that's a pretty straightforward and easy to understand idea that, yeah, if you've been, if you've been hit hard, maybe the next time you build back, you're going to build back different, right? You're going to try to do something to mitigate or to reduce those impacts. A good example, in 1752, that bad storm that hit Charleston, it blew down all the houses that were stick built, toppled the chimneys, flooded the, the town, completely over flooded the town. Um, so all the houses built after the 1752 storm in Charleston, uh, they, they used different techniques. They used masonry, they used heavy gauge uh, doors and shutters, uh, and they started building their homes up a little higher on what are called half basements. So many of the homes built uh, during the uh, latter part of the 18th century and the early part of the 19th century um, have these half basements that really kind of give you a little boost up above what potential floods might be. But resiliency is really the, the key that we all need to be thinking about for the future. Um, and when I talk about resiliency, I'm saying resiliency from the individual and for the community. Um, and it can be lots of things. Uh, it can be building smarter and, and you know, choosing where to build. It can be elevating your home. And that's a lot of that has happened in Eastern North Carolina. Drive down through some of the areas that were hardest hit by Matthew and Florence through some of those communities, you'll see some devastation where the house is never gonna to be touched again. And in other cases where they have actually elevated the homes, it's not easy to do, it's not cheap, um, but the alternative very often is either suffer through multiple floods or consider buyouts. And um, FEMA and the state of North Carolina and South Carolina have been engaged in buyout programs uh, through some of these storms to, to really remove neighborhoods in the worst areas, the worst uh, flooded areas. One of the things that um, I, I want to talk about just real quickly that's a real takeaway is that our ability to cope with disasters has, has changed, but it's always been a struggle. 
Uh, and a great example was that 1893 storm that I was talking about earlier. In 1893, there was no FEMA. Um, there wasn't really the ability for a community um, to deal with a disaster of the scope with, with 30,000 people homeless and starving. What are you gonna do? So who came to the rescue for the people in South Carolina that were hit by the Sea Islands hurricane? It wasn't the South Carolina legislature. They refused to provide any funding. It wasn't Congress. Uh, Clara Barton, who is of course the founder of the Red Cross, went to Congress and said, look, we've got 30,000 people in the Sea Islands that are going to starve to death and Congress refused to act. So she took it on herself and Clara Barton moved her operation uh, down to Beaufort, South Carolina for a period of about a year in 1893, brought in donations, volunteers, and it, because the, the effort wasn't simply to, um, to help people who had been injured or maybe give them food or clothing, they did all that. The real effort was to rebuild their community because all of their farm fields had been flooded with salt water. They were still standing with salt water. It all had to be ditched and drained. They had to uh, replenish the soil. They had to bring in new seed and replant crops or else these people would starve. And that's the scene you see on the right is a Red Cross um, bringing in groups to help prepare potatoes for planting uh, through the, the fall of 1893. Um, the same kind of thing happened actually during Hugo. You heard me say what a, a quiet period we'd had in the 60s and 70s and early 80s. When Hugo came, um, it was uh, unfortunately not handled well. Let's just put it that way. Um, there was a lot of criticism to go around. Uh, emergency management officers and the Red Cross and nonprofits even that didn't uh, have the capacity or the planning in place or the knowledge to be able to cope with a scope and scale of a disaster like Hugo. And the criticism were flying in so many different directions that um, it was a real tragedy because so many people lost out on receiving any kind of help. And it was a turning point in our nation's history of emergency management. And this is when FEMA and uh, state local emergency management uh, level operations really began to see increased funding was because of Hurricane Hugo. And then just three years later, Hurricane Andrew in South Florida, it was really kind of a repeat. Um, the, there wasn't the, the um, marshalling of resources that we typically see today during these storms. Another lesson, uh, pretty obvious uh, from my earlier slide, you don't have to live at the coast to get slammed by hurricanes. Uh, we've got lots of evidence of these storms uh, striking uh, parts west, including that great flood in Asheville. Um, something else that uh, meteorologically is fascinating to me is that with, we often, we, we know about the Sapphire Simpson scale, where we rate storms from one to five, how strong they are. But one thing that's interesting is that there's not a really a correlation between strength and size. And look at this chart. Um, the, the largest circle you see there, that's that 1893 hurricane. That's one of the largest hurricanes in diameter, in size, ever to strike the United States. Hurricane Sandy is another one. Sandy was about a thousand miles across as it made its way over uh, New York. Um, this storm uh, in 1893 uh, was so large that it caused wind damage in all counties in South Carolina and over 50% of the counties in North Carolina. And I'm talking about major wind damage. But then compare that to Hugo, which is the center circle that gives you a, a, an idea of the scope and scale of that. And then the smallest circle you'll see there, that's Hurricane Andrew. Hurricane Andrew, of course, hit in, in uh, below Miami in 1992 as a cat five, but look how small it was in, in, term, in terms of scale. There were um, some parts of, of, um, of Miami that were untouched uh, by Hurricane Andrew, and then you could travel just eight blocks and it was total devastation. So uh, that's the nature of these storms is there, there are a lot of differences. The other thing that uh, you hear a lot about, you heard me reference the Sapphire Simpson scale, that scale of one to five, a lot of our storms here in the Carolinas are not the big wind storms uh, like uh, you would expect, uh, or even like a storm like a Hugo uh, or, uh, or an Andrew or even an Ian, uh, as we saw in Florida. The winds uh, can be 
They certainly can be, and we saw that with Fran and, and uh, Hugo and Hazel, but many of our storms are lower on the scale, category one, category two, doesn't sound very impressive until you realize that the category has nothing to do with rainfall. It is only a measurement of wind. So the rainfall from these um, certainly um, show us how even a cat one uh, deserves our respect. We also have to recognize that it's not always the big storms uh, that, that get us. Uh, look at what happened in 2004. None of these storms, with exception of Alex on the far right, was a landfalling hurricane uh, in North Carolina. All of these storms were landfalls somewhere else, but the remnants passed over our state. And the combination of these seven storms caused more damage than in North Carolina than many hurricanes do to agriculture, to infrastructure, and to homes. So it's, it's not always the big storm we have to worry about. Sometimes it can be a barrage of smaller storms. And then for everyone, and then this is especially true for the emergency management community, you have to expect the unexpected. Each disaster brings its own challenges. Who would have known that during Hurricane Floyd, we would have had more than three dozen um, coffins become disinterred and, and come rising up? And then there's a tremendous challenge of identifying whose or whose and where do they, where do they belong? What family do they belong to? Uh, this is one of the lessons we learned. We, we came back and passed new laws after Floyd so that identification markers are now placed inside coffins uh, as they're put in the ground so that we know if they were ever to float up again, they could easily be identified. Uh, the process of identifying those 36 took over two years and ultimately resulted in, in lots and lots of families very disappointed, having to go through the DNA process, just a really difficult, difficult time. And the surprises just seem like they come from all angles. After Hurricane Floyd, there was a rush of volunteer groups, churches, um, citizens who banded together to help rebuild Eastern North Carolina. They came to communities, hard hit communities in Greene County, Pitt County, Craven County, Wayne County, wherever the need was. And they set up shop and they helped homes, helped people rebuild their homes and they did their mission and then they left. And then weeks go by, months go by in some cases, and we found out that the homes were not rebuilt the way they should have been uh, because the mold came back and many of those houses then had to be torn out again the second time. So there are lots of lessons to be learned along the way about um, how you cope with the rebuilding of a flooded home. You've got to destroy um, any moisture that's in the wood or else you're gonna have the same problem is gonna come back again. We also learned <clears throat> through all these floods, uh, it's not a good idea to put your junkyards down by the river. Kind of makes sense now when you think about it, but traditionally the cheap land in our state and really everywhere has always been down by the water or at least in, in river rivers, not, not necessarily down the ocean. Um, the cheapest land was land that might flood. And as a result, over the centuries, it uh, has been relegated to the lower income communities. And that's one of the reasons why every flood that we have, whether it's Florence or Floyd or Fran, you name one, um, there's a disproportionate impact on low income communities across our states. Um, there's not really a whole lot we can do to change that overnight, uh, but it is uh, a reality that we have to recognize. And we also know that um, the agricultural impact, of course, North Carolina is a big agricultural state, but um, we had some devastating lessons to be learned, uh, particularly during Floyd with tremendous losses of livestock. Uh, during Matthew and Florence, we lost livestock as well, but there have been so many lessons learned. Our agricultural community has done a, a very good job of trying to minimize and mitigate uh, those losses in the future. Um, I put this chart up here. I don't expect you to read the whole thing, but um, I, I do want to just make one point, and that is that, or two points. Um, one of the things I talk about is uh, is the sunny day flooding that we typically get in North Carolina after a big hurricane, and that is to say that the storm rolls through, like Florence, and it's really bad, and everything's flooded, except that the water that's landed on the Piedmont has got to 
work its way back down to the coast. And so many communities like Kinston, New Bern, um, Wilmington, these are areas that don't see the, the peak water until maybe a week or two weeks even after the storm has passed. That's certainly been true down in uh, um, Horry County, South Carolina. So there's a delayed effect, and then we have to know and prepare for that. But the other thing is that we continue to break new records, of course, with these storms. The yellow indicates the records. And one, what's interesting is if you look at these river systems, you can see the records that still stand with Floyd uh, on the Tar River at Rocky Mount and Greenville and Contentia Creek at Hookerton. That's the highest water ever recorded during Floyd. Then Matthew broke some records. Uh, and then Florence came and broke some more. Uh, so in some cases, you had new records set by Floyd that was broken by Matthew and then later broken by Florence. Uh, but it all depends on where you are, which part of the state you're in. On the Outer Banks, we have um, special challenges. Uh, and I would argue that the, um, the, the journey up and down Highway 12 that we all love so much, um, that's part of the charm, isn't it? Is that it's right on the edge. It might not be there next time you go, so you might as well enjoy it while you're there. That's sort of the mentality I have when I'm down on driving on that road. Uh, it, is, uh, um, it, it is interesting to see how the State Department of Transportation has dealt with this over the period of time, and there is another new bridge uh, located on Roanoke Island, excuse me, on uh, Hatteras Island now that helps to alleviate some of the worst flooding, but this is gonna be a continued issue as sea level rises and we continue to get storms that do what they wanna do. Opening and closing inlets from time to time is uh, not unlike them. Another um, big takeaway, and this is not a, a, anything newsworthy, except to say that we have been blessed to have military resources here in the Carolinas that have come to our aid every time we've had a disaster. And if we didn't have them, I don't know exactly how we would have managed uh, during Hurricane Floyd with the, the Army, the Navy, the Marines, the Coast Guard, the National Guard, uh, everyone pitching in uh, and in a collaborative way, working closely with our Department of um, Public Safety uh, to try to do whatever's needed to save lives and to, uh, to help people recover as quickly as possible. We're very, very thankful that we have the military resources at hand we do. All right, I know I'm going on and on and on, but I've got just a couple more. And this is probably the most important thing I'm gonna say all day. So listen closely. If there's one takeaway that you leave here with and lodge it in your brain, don't forget, the most important thing for you to know is that the most dangerous thing you can do during a hurricane is to drive your vehicle. It should seem obvious, but every storm we get, um, people take their chances. They get in their four wheel drives. They think, well, the waters, maybe it's not that deep. I think I can make it. I don't have that far to go. They've got all their excuses, um, but it ends up in tragedy over and over and over again. You've heard the expression, turn around, don't drown. Uh, and every storm, uh, it continues to be an issue. With uh, Hurricane Floyd, the 52 fatalities in North Carolina, 28 of them were people who drowned in their vehicles. Um, the same uh, similar ratio existed with Matthew and Florence. Um, you can see uh, this uh, is sort of a test case here. Um, this Chevrolet that's down at the bottom there was trying to drive on a flooded road. But when they were driving, they couldn't see that the road had washed out underneath because all they saw was water ahead. They thought it was maybe only, you know, a couple of feet deep. So when they got to the washout, their car sinks. And fortunately, they were able to escape, uh, save their own lives and swim, swim to high ground. But then the car was down there with the water still above it. And next thing you know, we've got big military transport vehicles driving over top of their car. So um, it's just kind of a common sense thing, but it, it does bear repeating, turn around, don't drown. Um, <clears throat> there's, we could spend a lot of time talking about the financial impact of these storms, but we do know that over time, our hurricanes are becoming more expensive. Um, and it's not just the picking up the pieces and rebuilding the homes. It's everything from uh, the planning and preparation that's involved to improving our infrastructure to make it uh, uh, better for higher bridges or whatever that needs to be done for the roadways. Um, it can be uh, the insurance factor 
Uh, we know that uh, flood insurance is a big, big problem. Not enough people have flood insurance in North Carolina, and that was one of the great tragedies of Hurricane Matthew and Florence. Um, there's also a, a great deal of complexity and misunderstanding on the part of the public about what is going to happen now that my house has been completely wiped out and maybe I don't have the best insurance, what's going to happen to me? Uh, it's a complex thing. Uh, it can be very emotional and it can devastate families uh, in lots of ways. Um, so financially, uh, we know that hurricanes are getting more expensive and that trend is not going to change. Well, meteorologically, we also know that records are made to be broken. And so when I talk about that 18 foot storm surge down at Calabash during Hurricane Hazel or the 19 foot storm surge uh, in Bulls Bay in South Carolina or the 39 inches of rain in Elizabethtown during Hurricane Florence, um, you know, it's just a matter of time. Someday another storm is going to come along and top that figure. So we've got lots of evidence that shows that when you've got an incredible record and you think, oh my gosh, no one could ever break that record. And then next thing you know, along comes a storm that does. Look what happened with Hurricane Harvey with almost 50 inches of rain in Texas. No one thought it was even possible. So the future for hurricanes in the Carolinas is going to unfortunately include a lot of misery. There's gonna be a lot more flooding. There's gonna be a lot more storms. Um, but there are some bright spots. And one of the things that um, I think is probably the overriding feeling that I have after talking to the people that I've talked to and doing the research that I have is that we have a great will to help each other, to survive, and to build back better. And that's one of the things that um, I know at various levels of government and even within local communities, you hear that regularly. We're strong. We're, we're not going anywhere. Nobody's picking up to move out of the region. What we need to do is to think smart. Uh, much of North Carolina and South Carolina, frankly, has been, um, you, you could say it's been built around the climate of the past. And what we're going to see in the future is going to be a little bit different, incrementally so. Um, but one of the things that I, I would I would end with here just to, um, or almost end with, is to say that um, the most important audience for this talk and for this message are the planners, the people who serve on planning boards, um, who, who set policy, uh, government agencies who have the responsibility to direct where and how we build. Um, they have a lot of impact on what the future is going to be like for storms in the future. Because I will tell you that even though uh, we hear about climate all the time in our, uh, on the news media and, you know, the wildfires, um, the flooding, uh, things like hurricanes, uh, tornadoes that we're experiencing, um, certainly there must be connection, right? Well, what is that connection? It's, it's one of the things we're recognizing now is that the science is catching up with that. We're starting to get a better handle, at least from hurricanes, on what we can expect in the future. So um, in part of my research, since I'm not a scientist, I went to talk to all the best people. Uh, talked with the folks at the National Hurricane Center, talked to the folks at the National Weather Service, other researchers, climatologists, um, people who are involved in emergency management. I wanted to get the best uh, uh, picture on this that I could. And the most helpful person that I was able to speak to is actually a friend of mine. His name is Chris Lancy, who is the director of research for the National Hurricane Center. And he's been there a long time. He leads their research effort. And um, he's an amazing uh, scientist. And he's very plain spoken, though, about what climate is going to mean for hurricanes. And he shared that with me. I've got that in the book, but I'm going to share a couple of highlights because I think it's sort of the crux for what's on a lot of people's minds. What are we going to expect? So the first thing I'm going to say is, let me back up. Let me first thing I'm going to say is that if you want to anticipate what are the next hundred years going to look like for hurricanes in the Carolinas, the best place to start is to go back and look at the last 100. If there was no climate change, if everything was status quo, we still are going to suffer through a lot of big, bad storms, right? That's going to happen. But they are going to be enhanced now by um, a warming planet. So what are, the, what are the changes that we can expect? Well, the first one is the best computer models are telling us that by the year 2100, 
Our hurricanes in the Atlantic will be stronger, but only slightly, probably less than 5% stronger. That's not terribly shocking news. Um, I think one of the things that we, that maybe there's a fear that we're gonna start seeing cat fives every year roll ashore here. And that's not exactly the case. What the science is saying is that yes, the storms have the potential to be slightly stronger by 2100, perhaps as much as 5%. So that's not terrible news, but it still is something we have to factor in. The second thing is um, how many storms should we see? Well, the average hurricane season in the Atlantic has about seven hurricanes, 14 named storms, seven hurricanes, 14 and seven. And that's, a, that's plenty. <clears throat> doesn't mean they're all coming to North Carolina, but they're in, in the average year. That's what we can expect. So the science is saying that in 2100, we'll probably have about the same number. And the reason is that um, there's going to be a lot of climatic changes that will introduce dry air that will uh, prevent some storms from forming uh, while there's additional heat that will maybe add some. So we've got a sort of a balancing act there. The third thing, though, is much more concerning in that it is very likely that our hurricanes are going to become much wetter. And um, I think you can sort of get what I'm saying here. Uh, all hurricanes are different. Some can blow through. They're more wind storms. They don't drop a lot of rain. Hazel was not a tremendous rainmaker in as it swept through North Carolina, but Florence was. Uh, and the storms of the future are probably going to be more like the Florence model than the Hazel model. And then the last thing, which is sort of exacerbates that, is that they're very likely to be more slow moving. You know, we talked about the forward speed of a storm and uh, Hazel racing forward at 50 miles an hour and Florence creeping along at two miles an hour. Well, those slow moving storms, uh, they bring additional pain and suffering because it gives more time for rain to fall. It's more time for the wind to blow. You just want the thing to go ahead and get on out of here. And if it lingers or stalls, then that's a problem. And those are, those are some of the things that we can expect. All right, I'm gonna conclude with just a couple of things. I wanna just suggest to you that everyone needs a hurricane evacuation plan. You need to make sure you know where you're going who you're taking with you and what supplies you need. So make sure you've got that. If you don't have a hurricane evacuation plan, maybe your plan is just, I'm gonna stay right here because I'm on high ground in a solid building. And that's okay, it depends on where you live. Um, I will say that the, uh, the future for hurricanes in the Carolinas looks bleak, but the past teaches us a lot of lessons. We have um, a lot of, um, smart people working on these problems. As we grow in Eastern North Carolina, we're gonna to continue to see um, challenges with everything from uh, flooding storms, dams that burst, all kinds of things that we have to wrestle with as a, as a community. Uh, but, but you can, I guess, take this to know that our challenges are not so much about the storms themselves the meteorology, the hurricanes that arrive, uh, we're gonna continue to get them. And we've, we've always gotten them. We're gonna continue to get them. What's gonna be different is what is North Carolina gonna look like in 2100? How many people will live here? Uh, our problem is a people problem as much as it is a hurricane problem. Growth is what is propelling the costs going up on these storms. $24 billion in damage from Florence is the direct result of the number of homes that were flooded. Uh, and the growth that we're seeing in much of Eastern North Carolina is a good thing. We want to see growth, but we need smart growth. We need to make sure that we're not putting more new communities in harm's way and doing what we can uh, to mitigate the impact on those communities that have been there uh, for a while. So that's my presentation on the 15 storms that changed the Carolinas. Hope you get a chance to look through the book, read about some of the other uh, tales I didn't get a chance to talk about today. Uh, but I'll be glad, Stacy, to answer any questions that anyone might have. Thank you so much, Shay. Um, we have quite a few questions from our virtual attendees, so we can start there and then take in-person questions. Um, the first one is from Aaron Clenard. He says, in your historical experience in this area, do you have an opinion about whether or not the history and pattern and frequency of these storms have anything to do with the political issue of climate change? Well, um, I would start by saying that 
the changes that we're experiencing in our climate, um, they're only perceived as political if you, if you choose to look at it that way, because the science is there. The science tells us that our planet is getting warmer. The oceans are getting warmer. And we're going to have to cope with that one way or the other. Um, however, let me stop there and say that uh, it would not be fair or accurate to point to a storm like Florence and say, oh, well, Florence was this bad because our climate is changing. It just doesn't quite work that way. So what I would, I think to answer the question best, I would say that um, the changes that we're, we are experiencing and we will experience with climate are going to impact us. And maybe they already are to a small degree, but <clears throat> this is not a situation where we point to storms and assign blame to a rising uh, temperature of our planet. Um, Dr. Uh, Canterbury from Cary, North Carolina says, I've heard that Hurricane Fran caused so much damage, i.e. down trees, et cetera, that Umstead Park was closed for weeks or months. Do you know if that's accurate? Um, I do not know the accuracy of, of how long the park was closed but it does not surprise me at all because Hurricane Fran, much like Hazel, toppled so many thousands and thousands of trees all across the triangle that um, I can imagine that a place like Umstead would have been uh, a real mess to clean up. Uh, I know that um, in some of the places like Dick's Park here in Raleigh, um, they had the same kind of problem. I mean, you, you go out there to Dick's Park today and you see these majestic large trees. Well, Think about how many have been lost over the years uh, to some of these big storms. Our next question is from Susie, and they say, I understand that a number of houses in the Outer Banks were condemned post-storm because of failed septic systems. Do you know if septic systems are still common in low-lying areas today? Um, the answer is yes. There are lots of communities in eastern North Carolina that um, still rely on septic uh, and it is a particular problem on the beaches. Um, you know, they're only the larger beach communities, uh, places like Nags Head or Wrightsville Beach um, have um, centralized wastewater. So there are a lot of beach communities that still use septic, yes. Um, and then our next question is um, from Sherry. They say back in the day, living through a hurricane like Hazel or Hugo seemed to be rare events. Now, many people are living through multiple hurricanes, uh, including myself. Why do you think that is? That's a great question. And there is no answer. Um, there is a randomness that we uh, can only speculate about uh, with regard to the pattern of hurricanes. I talked about that barrage of storms that we had during the 50s and then that quiet period during the 60s and 70s. And I'm yet to hear a, a really solid explanation as to why. Similar uh, thing happened in Florida where in the 1940s, they had something like 12 hurricane landfalls in 10 years in Florida. Um, so you can, get, you can go through very intense periods with lots of uh, hurricane events, and then you can go through quiet periods. Uh, there are, in my book, I talk about some of the meteorological um, research has been done about long-term cycles that uh, can be affecting on this. And I would recommend just check that out because the, uh, um, that long-term cycle has been around and is known pretty well, about 20 to 40 year cycle of increased activity. It's based on the sea surface temperatures in the Atlantic. Do we have any questions from our in-person audience? Um, our intern Hannah is bringing you a microphone. Thank you. Uh, Jay, I once read that a little over 60% of all Americans live within one hour or less of a major body of water. Obviously, the West Coast and the East Coast rivers like the Mississippi and many others. As a planner, what would you say to that? We like our water. We like our recreation. We like to fish. We like to be around water. Look at it. As a planner, what would you say to that? I agree with them. I, I like my water too. <laughs> I, was born, I was born on the water in Southport. I spent a lot of time on a boat and on a surfboard and 
enjoying the beach, just like everyone. Uh, and I know exactly what you're saying. The, the coastal counties, just to add to what you're talking about, the coastal counties in the United States are the fastest growing counties. Not really too shocking uh, to hear that because they do include you know, some of our growth cities and places like Miami and Charleston and Norfolk and uh, and, and they are increasingly vulnerable. We, we have more people moving into harm's way every day. Florida is now the fastest growing state in the nation uh, by a long shot. Um, and, you know, there are, as a planner, there are problems with that. And, and one of the things that um, we don't have time to get into all the details of, but I will just throw this out there, is that um, the economics of owning a beach house <clears throat> could be turned sideways in the future should the insurance industry um, struggle to meet the needs of customers or stop writing policies. Uh, that would have a big impact. It's already going to be interesting to see what happens in Florida. After Andrew, we had an insurance crisis. All of our insurance rates went up accordingly here in North Carolina. Same thing happened after Katrina. Nationwide insurance rate went up after Katrina. Big storms that have tremendous payouts are gonna to continue to hit the insurance industry. And so the economic impact on living near the water is going to probably increase. It's gonna become more difficult, more challenging, I should say, but it doesn't mean it's gonna end. Uh, I don't think anybody sees that happening. There are very few places where it's practical to call retreat. Re by retreat, I'm saying, let's, let's back away from this area. Um, now, it happened in here in North Carolina in 1899 uh, when the storms hit down in Carteret County out on Shackleford Banks, the community out there, the entire community packed up and left. And so today, when you go to Shackleford, there's no, there's no city there. But Diamond City used to be a thriving town. They retreated. They said, We've we're tired of these storms. We're not having it anymore. We're going to the mainland. We're past that point. I don't see people pulling back from Myrtle Beach or Kill Devil Hills or anywhere. Uh, so I think the bigger challenge, frankly, uh, that I see for the Carolinas in terms of the future storms is really not on the beaches. It's, it's on the river systems. Um, and it's the dams, the, the thousands of dams in North and South Carolina that are at risk um, should we have a, a major, major rain-making flood. So there are lots of complex answers to your question, but I would say as a planner, um, yeah, there would reason, be reason to be concerned in general. Do we have any other questions from audience members? All right, well, Jay, I just wanna thank you so much for taking the time to join us today and sharing all of your incredible work and research with us. Um, this has been a really special treat, so thank you. Thank you for being here. And thank you to those of us, who, those of you who joined us. Um, as I said, Jay is gonna be outside signing copies of his book, so be sure to stop by. And uh, we'll see you next month at our um, History at High Noon, the Battle of Moore's Creek on July 19th. Have a great day.